Millions of dollars, millions of pounds. The value of all these items is astronomical. In vaults, galleries, and trains. It was quite outrageous. By mobsters, madmen, and dreamers. It was almost like people were cheering the guy on, you know? It was the reaction that people had for this. They're surprised and shocked. Wow, he got away with it. Risking their lives, defying the law. They sprayed the guy's legs and, and crutch area with, with petrol, and then they shook a box of matches and said, listen, you know, you've got 10 seconds to give us these keys or we're just going to set you on fire. For the thrill, for the cash, for the glory. This was the greatest caper ever. All robberies of the century. What drives a robber to risk it all? It could be money. It could be danger. It could be revenge. We did not give Philip Johnson the credit for being as smart as he was. The reward? A dream come true. This robbery was a bunch of old robbers looking for pension money for retirement. The risk? Disaster, catastrophe, destruction. These men, bound by a hunger to defy the law and achieve the impossible, found fame, found money, and even immortality. They got in, it didn't hurt anyone, and they got out with this enormous sum of money. Each thief with a scheme and a dream. The Great Train Robbery has always been identified as something that was special, something that was so totally unusual and so individual that it's been revered ever since. On a warm August night, a gang of London crooks pulled off the most daring robbery of the modern age, a crime that harkens back to the exploits of Jesse James and other legendary figures from America's wild, wild west. The target was an ordinary mail train. Inside the train, two and a half million pounds in cash, the equivalent of five million dollars. A generation later, all great robberies are still measured against this, the Great Train Robbery. I can tell you from my own knowledge that the Great Train Robbery, the background, the theory of it, had been hawked around the, the underworld for some years. It was like a film script that had been bandied about all over the place. The script needed a director someone with a painter's vision, someone who could figure out the big picture and pull together a team of professionals to paint it. In England, that vision belonged to Bruce Reynolds. When you're a professional thief, you're always looking for, if you like, the, the biggest canvas, uh, if you like, to artistically paint the masterpiece on. Growing up in England during World War II, Reynolds found escape in the world of movies. He craved the adventure he saw on the silver screen. By age 32, he was a professional thief with a prison record and a growing reputation in the London underworld. I was engaged really in non-confrontational crime, in other words, that um, generally consist of breaking into premises, um, usually commercial premises, jeweler shops, banks. They enable you to carry on while you're looking for El Dorado. And El Dorado, of course, um, actually was a train in my case. Reynolds was pointed towards El Dorado by an employee of the Royal Mail Train System. This informant told Reynolds that the mail train carried more than just letters and parcels during its 400-mile overnight journey from Glasgow to London. In fact, after bank holidays, the train carried millions of pounds in currency from local banks to their headquarters in London. Best of all, the train and its valuable cargo were virtually unprotected. It was quite outrageous. Never had a train been stopped in such a place that it could be robbed 
And of course, this, was a, this wasn't an ordinary train, this was a travelling post office. And the thieves knew perfectly well that there was an awful lot of money on it that night. Reynolds put together a gang that included 15 robbers and one retired train conductor. For three months, they worked on their mission impossible. They decided to stop the train near Cheddington, a quiet farming village 40 miles north of London. Without tipping off the postal workers on board, they would subdue the train operators. They would disconnect the locomotive and the first two cars from the train. Their own driver would move the cars a mile up the track to Bredego Bridge. This was a stretch of railway line that was totally deserted. This little tiny bridge, little used by any kind of traffic, uh, vehicular or pedestrian, and yet it was absolutely ideal. At Bredego Bridge, the gang would load the money into several waiting vehicles. Rather than drive back to London, they planned to hide out at a farmhouse nearby and split up the money. Once the police heat had died down, they would go their separate ways. Nothing was left to chance in their script. Bruce Reynolds honed it and, and filed it and made it absolute perfect. He joined a fishing club near to Brigado Bridge. He took film of, of the area. He watched the trains as they went past and took films of them, so that before the thing ever came to the table, when it was all planned, it was precise. Around three o'clock in the morning on August 8th, 1963, Reynolds and his gang put their plan into action. They cut the phone wires in the area so that no one could call out for help. They also rigged several lights on the track so that the train driver would stop the train. We had to replace the green main signal with a red signal. And this was done by the simple expedient of putting a glove over the existing bulb and wiring up our own battery with our own bulb, red and amber. With their trap in place, the robbers waited anxiously in the darkness as their target approached. Once I'd identified the train, I then radioed through to the guy that was on the signals, and there's two signals, so there was two messages, and all I said, this is it, this is it, this is it, three times. Exactly as planned, the train came to a grinding halt. The gang boarded the train and subdued the driver, Jack Mills, by violently clubbing him. And then they also disconnected and reconnected the uh, hydraulic system so that the, the brakes could be effective on that part of the train that they were driving away. So it meant then that they were taking about uh, a third of the train away from the rest. The gang's train driver was supposed to drive the front part of the train to Bredego Bridge. There, the rest of the robbers were waiting. But there was a big problem. The gang's driver had experience with all kinds of locomotives, all except this one. It was totally different. And so when he came to it and he looked in the carriage, he realized immediately, I can't drive this train. And that, of course, is where the, the whole plan of the situation degenerated. In desperation, the robbers turned to Jack Mills, the train's official driver, who was bleeding badly from a head wound. They demanded that he move the cars to the rendezvous point. When Mills refused, they threatened to club him again. They'd badly hurt Mills, the driver of the train. He was semi-conscious, really. If they'd knocked him right out, they never would have moved the train. Fearing for his life, Mills drove the locomotive and first two cars to Bredego Bridge. On the road beneath the bridge, the gang had parked a truck and two Land Rovers. To move the dozens of sacks of money, they formed a human chain. Every bag had to be manhandled out of the coach and down the embankment and then loaded onto the lorry. And I'd allowed uh, half an hour for this particular part of the operation to go on. Reynolds and his gang loaded 120 bags into their vehicles. 
Before making their getaway, they handcuffed Jack Mills and the train's firemen together in the locomotive. They told the two men to stay quiet for 30 minutes. As they drove off into the night, the gang celebrated. But Bruce Reynolds had something else on his mind. I thought, well, I've, I've got it, I've got the money, what do I do now? And it really, something had gone out of my life, that, um, that I'd found El Dorado. What do you do after you found El Dorado? At their farmhouse, Reynolds and the gang divvied up the money in equal shares, each of them receiving about 150,000 pounds. In today's currency, that would be more than $1 million per person. As the robbers celebrated their success, the rest of England was slowly waking up to the enormity of the crime that had just been committed. When it first happened, I thought, oh gosh, this is a stinker. I mean, this is going to be a really difficult one. At that time, Malcolm Futrell was the detective superintendent in Buckinghamshire County, the jurisdiction where the train was robbed. He was among the first investigators on the scene. The most peculiar thing was, it was just dawn, dawn was just breaking, and there were these ten coaches with postmen looking out of the window, having no idea at all why they had lost a bit of the train, and it, it was really most remarkable. Futrell was scheduled to retire any day, but he postponed it to stay on the case. He was joined by Nipper Reed, a detective with the London Metropolitan Police. Reed had spent much of his career chasing the big fish in London's criminal pond. It was headlined as the greatest robbery the world has ever known, and so everybody was talking about it, and uh, as a, a police officer, uh, it was common knowledge that all of us wanted to be involved in the investigation if we possibly could. The investigators had few clues. The thieves had acted with military precision. Every minute, the trail was growing colder. Already, though, the police had their suspicions. There are only a few criminals in London capable of such an audacious crime. Bruce Reynolds was at the top of their list. So it was quite naturally that we would be suspected. Um, I knew this, of course, and of course some of the others did as well. Reynolds and company believe that if they avoided London and stayed out of sight at the farmhouse, they would be safe but luck quickly turned against them. Police investigators had become intrigued by something the robbers said during the heist. The most remarkable thing was that, that they had handcuffed the train driver and his fireman together, and one of the train robbers, before they left the scene, had said to him, don't move for half an hour, and we thought they might have a hideout that they could get to within half an hour. And the press interpreted that half an hour as 30 miles and made a big splash. The guesswork was amazingly accurate. The distance from the train to the farmhouse was exactly 28 miles. With a police dragnet and their own paranoia rapidly closing in on them, the robbers abandoned the hideout. Shortly afterward, a tip was phoned into police by a neighbor who had noticed suspicious activity at the farmhouse. Detectives went to investigate. We went into the farmhouse with our hands in our pockets, of course, because um, we were very conscious of the fact that there might be fingerprints about, and found stacks and stacks of food. The, the occupants who'd fled obviously had intended to be there a long, long time. The detectives found fingerprints on only a few items in the farmhouse, a saucer, the side of a bathtub. They matched the prints to some of the London suspects. Wanted posters were distributed to newspapers and leads began pouring in. Over the next few weeks, the police made several arrests. But where was the stolen money? You've got to understand that, that at that time in 1963, there was a kind of a mania Everybody was looking for people walking with suitcases. Everybody was saying, is this a genuine note or is it from the train robbery? With the police and the public in pursuit, several of the robbers abandoned their loot. Money was found in a phone booth, in suitcases dumped in fields, in an old RV. 
we broke into the caravan with some Surrey CID men and one very eagle-eyed Surrey policeman saw that the beading on the walls of the caravan had been disturbed. We took it off and instead of fibreglass it was packed with five pound notes. Bruce Reynolds went underground and spent the next five years as an international fugitive. The other train robbers weren't as lucky. By the end of 1963, the police had 13 of them in custody. One pled guilty, the other 12 were put on trial. But before a verdict was reached, the public already seemed to be on their side. It was an unprecedented crime. I mean, the, um, people were absolutely thrilled about the whole affair. The groundswell of the public opinion was with us, but of course the authorities were very, very much against us. It's always difficult to know what uh, is in the public mind when they look at bank robbers or gangsters and, and begin to idolise them. Ten of the 12 gang members were convicted for their roles in the robbery. Despite the fact that the train driver had been beaten over the head, many people thought the punishment handed down to the robbers was excessive. Altogether, the sentences totaled 307 years. This was robbery on an enormous scale. Robbing the Queen's Mail was something that didn't happen. And what the judge felt, I think, was that he wanted to make sure that it couldn't happen again. After tracking Bruce Reynolds in Mexico, Canada and Europe, detectives finally captured him in southwest England. He was sentenced to 25 years in prison, but was released after serving 10. I think the, the rate I was living my life, I, I didn't, never expected to, to reach 35. I mean, that, um, you know, life was just one big risk. To date, of the 2.6 million pounds stolen by Reynolds and his gang, only 300,000 pounds have been recovered. No one knows for sure what happened to the rest of the money. Most of the great train robbers paid a high price for their daring crime. But for pulling off this robbery of the century, they all found lasting fame. And Bruce Reynolds, the mastermind of it all, found his El Dorado. It was the largest heist that we know of in history uh, up to that point. Uh, it was pulled off by an individual who many viewed as kind of a downtrodden individual. Uh, some people sided with him, even not knowing what his motives were. Most people who hate their job will complain, rebel, or quit. This man, Philip Johnson, chose a completely different solution. After years of planning, he turned on his employer, Loomis Fargo, in Jacksonville, Florida, and retaliated by stealing more than $18 million. It was the largest cash robbery in U.S. history. When I was told of the amount of the possible loss, I, I thought that the detective had misstated himself. Most who knew Philip Johnson said he was a loner, an outsider a romantic with few romantic possibilities. At the age of 33, he was a Loomis Fargo security guard making less than $8 an hour and repeatedly passed over for a promotion. In a letter written three and a half years after the robbery, Johnson was still bitter. Those thieves at Loomis Fargo violate God's laws every day that they operate. Their only concern is how they can extract the maximum amount of money from their customers and the maximum amount of work from their slaves for the least amount of pay. Johnson decided to strike back at the company he thought was making him a slave. For five years, he methodically planned his vengeful robbery exploring hideouts and extradition laws, learning Spanish, renting a storage unit in North Carolina, and creating a dozen different aliases. When we first started this investigation, we did not give Philip Johnson the credit for being as smart as he was. On the Saturday of Easter weekend in 1997, 
Philip Johnson struck. As usual, he and another driver picked up cash deposits from some local markets. They returned to the Loomis Fargo warehouse where two other guards, James Terry Brown and Dan Smith, prepared to lock the money into the vault. Johnson turned his gun on his two co-workers. He ordered them to lie on the ground while he handcuffed and shackled them. They were uh, in shock that this whole thing was going on. Are you kidding me? Philip says, I'm not playing. He says, I, I mean it. But, you know, I'll shoot you. Let's do what I tell you to do. Over the next two hours, Johnson loaded 900 pounds of cash and checks into an unmarked white van. He grabbed his personnel file and the security camera tape. He hustled Brown and Smith into the back of the van. As he had planned, everything went like clockwork until Johnson hit a snag. It's typical Philip Johnson, the way his life kind of gone, is not getting a break, but uh, he locks himself out of the van with $18 million inside the van. He has to break the window out to gain entry back into the van. Undaunted, Johnson drove a mile to his one-bedroom home on the south side of Jacksonville. Inside, he handcuffed Terry Brown to a pipe in one of the closets. He left behind some food and water. With Dan Smith under a blanket and the $18 million still in the back of the van, Johnson once again hit the road. This time, he headed to North Carolina. Arriving just after sunrise, he spent two hours unloading the money into a storage facility. Then, near the city of Asheville, he took Dan Smith into some nearby woods. Johnson shackled him to a tree. He truly hated Dan Smith. He felt like Dan had been there a couple of years and um, taken a promotion from him. Johnson didn't know it, but in his pocket, Dan Smith had a Swiss Army knife. Abandoned in the woods, Smith managed to pick the locks of his handcuffs and leg irons in just 30 minutes. He hitched a ride to a nearby ranger station where he called the police. They in turn notified Jacksonville police, who went to Johnson's house and freed Terry Brown from the closet. I think Brown agonized when he's hanging out in this closet and he's not knowing what's going to happen to him, to him, and I think he was very happy that it didn't take that long for people to get to him. But he described it as hell for him. Jim Schottler, a staff writer for the Jacksonville newspaper, was one of the first journalists to get wind of the heist. He raced to Johnson's house and peeked in one of the windows. What he saw provided a disturbing clue about Johnson's frame of mind. It was, it was partially open, not the window, but the blinds, right? And uh, I saw this thing spray painted on the wall. I'm like, what the hell is that? I look around and it says House of Pain, okay? It was spray painted in black on this wall. And I mean, it was just bizarre. Assigned to the case was the head of the Jacksonville Sheriff's Robbery Division, Lonnie McDonald. Working with him was a good friend and supervisor of Jacksonville's FBI office, okay. Mike Hurd. Phil Johnson's house was uh, not well kept. Uh, he was a pack rat. He kept a lot of little bitty things, and that's ultimately what led us uh, through the course of the investigation. Philip Johnson's House of Pain contained lots of clues about his years of planning the heist. Travel books, names and numbers scribbled on scraps of paper, books on how to launder money. The trail he left behind was helpful to detectives, but it wasn't enough to close the case. They assumed he would try to reach another country. They were nervous he might succeed. If we know of a false ID, we can set uh, various computer traps in the event that he tries to buy a passport, get a passport, use a passport. The FBI put all of Johnson's aliases in their database. They included the names Michael Gray and Roger Dale Lauder. The FBI circulated wanted posters throughout the United States, Canada, and Mexico. They discovered that the day after the robbery, a man calling himself Michael Gray had checked into an Asheville motel. The next day, he had boarded a bus for Atlanta. Despite these leads, the trail was growing cold. No one could find Philip Johnson. We stayed one day behind him for, for quite a while where we just missed him. 
The longer Johnson avoided capture, the more he became a local legend. For some people, he was a hero. This very average guy who made $7.75 an hour had taken revenge against his employer and escaped the law. A composer in Jacksonville even wrote a song about it. $7 an hour, that's what Philip Johnson made. It was almost like people were cheering the guy on, you know, it was the reaction that people had for this. They're surprised and shocked, and wow, he got away with it. The detectives knew Johnson was in phone contact with his family, who pleaded with him to give up. What investigators didn't know was that Johnson had made at least one trip back to Florida to renew a fake ID. His brazenness was starting to border on recklessness. One of the biggest, uh, most ironic things is, is one of the IDs that he made when he came back to Florida was Dan Smith. On the morning of August 30th, the cat and mouse game abruptly ended. Philip Johnson was traveling by passenger bus from Mexico into the United States. At the border crossing in Texas, a customs agent named Virginia Rodriguez asked him why he had visited Mexico. Johnson answered that he'd gone to visit friends. Rodriguez thought his tone was strange. He was coming up back into the United States, we believe, uh, to go back up and get more money. Why Phil Johnson took this opportunity to, to somehow become snippy with a, a customs officer, I can't explain it. He handed over a driver's license for Roger Dale Lauder of North Carolina. The Border Patrol ran the name through the FBI's National Crime Information Center database. It came up as the alias of one of the FBI's 10 most wanted. Now, this is one of those traps coupled by a mistake with uh, Phil Johnson that paid off to be the ultimate end to the investigation, which was his capture. Johnson was immediately arrested for robbery and kidnapping. But the question remained, where was the stolen money? In Johnson's pocket was a mysterious piece of paper with scribbles on it. Mike Hurd faxed it to a colleague in Mexico who thought it might be a map. And in a matter of just a few hours, they were able to decipher uh, exactly what that map was and, and what the location was. Uh, and it wound up being actually a room in a house rented by Philip Johnson. Police searched the modest rental house in Mexico and found a receipt for the storage locker in North Carolina. The name on the receipt was Michael Gray. Police got a search warrant and opened the locker. Inside, they found the missing millions. So he obviously wasn't going to live the lavish lifestyle. In fact, he was eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and riding the bus. And the stress had really wore on him, though, you could tell. 17 months after his capture, this former security guard was sentenced to 25 years in federal prison. He had dreams. He wanted to prove he was better than his job. He wanted to show his bosses that he was smarter than they were. In the end, he sacrificed his freedom to prove a point about the golden rule. If the corporations steal from their workers, they shouldn't be surprised that their workers steal from them. They should expect it. They are reaping what they've sown. One of the best stories I heard about as to the reasons for the committing of this robbery was a bunch of old robbers looking for pension money for retirement. What do professional criminals do when they're reaching the age of retirement and still haven't saved enough money to quit? They plan one more job, one more heist that will make them financially free. That's what a dozen criminals did when they took on Britain's Security Express Armored Services headquarters in 1983. Inside, seven million pounds in cash and checks, the equivalent of ten and a half million dollars. The Security Express robbery was exceptional because it was, at the time, it was Britain's biggest ever theft of cash. And uh, it was carried out with tremendous uh, panache, great style, and no one got hurt. Two of England's most notorious criminals were involved in the robbery. One of them was Freddie Foreman, the so-called managing director of British crime. If there was a godfather in the UK, it was Freddie Foreman. Crime reporter Jeff Edwards has closely followed his career. 
Well, Freddie Foreman was, uh, was and remains a very uh, colourful gangster character in, in England. He was a robber, he was a gunman, he, uh, he lived the life completely. That's what he did. He was a professional criminal. The other man was Ronnie Knight. Some called him a super criminal. He too had a long rap sheet, including charges for theft, arson, and murder. But Knight remains a very colorful character. At the time, he was married to um, a well-known uh, film and television actress, a woman called Barbara Windsor. The target was the headquarters of the Security Express Armored Services Company located on Curtain Road in East London. It was a four-story brick fortress protected by steel doors, dozens of alarms, and security cameras. The Security Express headquarters uh, was a building that was often described as Fort Knox. It was very heavily physically guarded, and uh, it was supposed to be a place you could not rob. But Security Express was vulnerable during bank holidays. For some portions of the day, there was only one guard working. The banks were closed, so there was no place to deposit money that had been picked up by the couriers. It all stacked up in the vault. The robbers decided to strike on Easter Monday in 1983. It's quite clear that the gang chose this weekend because someone had told them there's going to be a mega amount of money in there over the, that, week, that Easter weekend. And if you hit it then, you're going to really, you know, cream it off in a big way. The robbers wore disguises and carried shotguns. They scaled an outside wall and hid behind some trash bins. When the head guard walked into the yard, they jumped him and forced him back into the building. They tied him to a chair. Then two of the robbers climbed under the desk and pointed a shotgun at the man's crotch. For the next six hours, they waited for the other guards to arrive at work. And when a member of the staff arrived for work, he passed through the outer door and is in the inner area, enclosed in glass. And then he came through another door. They were met by two men with masks and shotguns who immediately blindfolded them and gagged them and tied their hands behind their back. They were then taken downstairs to a locker room and they were made to lie on the floor. The Security Express vault could only be opened by two guards turning special keys at the same time. But one set of keys was missing and the guard responsible for them wouldn't say where they were. The robbers quickly ran out of patience. So they went to him and one of the gang, of course we don't know which one it was, uh, had petrol and uh, he sprayed the guy's legs and, and crutch area. Then they shook a box of matches and said, listen, you know, you've got 10 seconds to give us these keys or we're just going to set you on fire. And uh, understandably, the guy just fished in his pocket and gave them what they wanted. In just two hours, the thieves moved five tons of money. They drove away with seven million pounds and vanished without a trace. One thing is absolutely sure of is that they knew, they absolutely knew that nothing was going to interrupt them. I think that that's why they were so confident. At the time, Reed McGeorge was a member of Scotland Yard's legendary flying squad, a fast response investigative unit that specializes in armed robberies. As news of the heist began to spread through London, he was one of the first detectives on the scene. And unfortunately, at the conclusion of the examination of the scene, there was no evidence, no forensic evidence came out of it. You always expect to resolve the crime. Otherwise, why bother investigating? You must have hope. For almost a year, the flying squad ran on hope. Finally, they got a tip that pointed to a low-level criminal named John Horsley. The tip paid off when the police found 275,000 pounds hidden on his property. Under questioning, Horsley gave up information that led to several other suspects. 
including Ronnie Knight. This was the largest cash robbery in British history. And you just can't walk away and leave it. You need a lucky break, and we've got our lucky break. Eventually, the police trail led to the godfather himself, Freddie Foreman. Inspecting his bank account, the police found that prior to the robbery, Foreman had only 72 pounds to his name. But in the months following the robbery, Foreman had been making frequent cash deposits. We then found this bank in which he paid some 362,000 pounds in cash over a period of two or three months. Feeling the net tightening, Freddie Foreman and Ronnie Knight, along with three other robbery suspects, fled the United Kingdom. They headed for the sunny coast of Spain, a country which at that time had no extradition treaty with the UK. There, each lived independently and luxuriously on what is known as the Costa del Crime, the criminal world's Spanish Riviera. All those guys who ran away really lived it up in Spain. Um, there they were, they were sitting on a pile of money. What else are you going to do? You're going to have a good time. So between them, they all bought very fancy uh, villas down there with swimming pools and so forth. They splashed out on cars. They splashed out on a lot of wine. They splashed out on a lot of hookers. For six years, Freddie Foreman enjoyed the good life. But Scotland Yard learned he had obtained a false passport, so the Spanish police arrested him. As he was being loaded onto a plane for London, Foreman put up a massive fight, sending two policemen to the hospital. Despite his violent resistance, Foreman was soon back in the UK to face charges in the Security Express robbery. He got nine years for an offence in Britain, which is called handling, which is, you know, basically is handling stolen goods. In this case, it was cash from the robbery. After 11 years as a fugitive, Ronnie Knight returned to England on his own. He said he wanted to clear his name. But some think he had a falling out with other criminals on the Costa del Crime and feared for his life. Like Freddie Foreman, he was convicted of handling the Security Express money. He was sentenced to seven years in prison. The police have always thought that Ronnie Knight was in the robbery. Um, if he wasn't in the robbery, why did he need to leave the country and go and hide out in Spain when the heat was on? To date, of the seven million pounds that were stolen from Security Express, only two million pounds have been recovered. So far, seven of the robbers have been tried and convicted. Charges are pending against two others. For Scotland Yard's flying squad, it's a source of great frustration. We still have um, people outstanding for committing this robbery and warrants are in existence for their arrest. Once they're all finished and dealt with, then you can say it's a success. For the criminal world, however, the Security Express heist is a textbook example of how to commit a robbery of the century. It was almost perfect. Um, everything went like clockwork. It went entirely to the plan. They got in, it didn't hurt anyone, and they got out with this enormous sum of money. You have to say that these robbers were, were a very cool bunch. I don't think there's any doubt that the Gardner Museum heist is one of the crimes of the century. First of all, the value of the items stolen is enormous. It's probably the greatest art heist of all time. What do you get when you mix $300 million of art with a poorly protected museum and a pair of daring art thieves? You get the biggest art robbery in American history, one of the crime world's greatest unsolved mysteries a masterpiece mystery. It came as a, a little bit of a surprise, uh, not a shock, that it had been taken down as it was, uh, primarily because uh, it was friends of mine who were involved in the theft. At the heart of it all is Miles Connor, a man who always had a taste for fine art. In the 70s and 80s, he earned a reputation throughout New England as a con man, escape artist, and master art thief. 
Reporter Tom Mashberg covered the Gardner heist for the Boston Herald newspaper. Miles Connor turned out to be a fascinating character. Here was a guy who was well known to be the mastermind behind numerous art crimes in this region. People talk about Miles in almost uh, admiring ways. He was kind of a gentleman bandit in, in a way. Gentlemen bandits like Miles Connor are attracted to places like Boston's Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. Built in 1903 as a recreation of a Renaissance palace, it's been recognized throughout the century for its remarkable collection of masterpieces by Degas, Titian, and Rembrandt. The collection was uh, somewhat superb. In fact, very superb for a museum of that size. And so, uh, those are the prime elements from the perspective of a thief. But security at the Gardner Museum never matched the value of its art. The systems were old. There was no centralized surveillance area. There was no May Day button or direct connection to police headquarters. And above all, the guards were inexperienced and undertrained. The two guards who were on duty the night that the museum was robbed were inexperienced young men, college students, basically uh, working uh, on the side to earn a little income. Shortly after midnight, while Boston was recovering from St. Patrick's Day in 1990, two men dressed as police officers approached the Gardner Museum's side entrance. Flashing their badges, they told the guards that they had been called to the museum because of a disturbance. Once inside, the phony policeman overpowered the two young men and moved them to the basement. The robbers worked for more than an hour, removing 13 works of art worth $300 million. The paintings that were taken were exceptionally valuable. Um, the concert and the two big Rembrandts um, were both, um, I mean, they're irreplaceable, they're priceless, actually, and I don't really know how you could, you can put a price on them. Uncovering the robbery the next morning, the museum called the police and then the FBI. The FBI assigned agent Tom Cassano to investigate. His first impression was that it was a professional job. It wasn't a whim. This, this job was planned. Uh, there's no question about it. Still, despite their value, the thieves' choices were unusual. They passed up some of the museum's celebrated works from the Italian Renaissance, in particular Titian's Rape of Europa. And two of the paintings they took, they devalued by slicing them out of their frames. One of these was the Storm on the Sea of Galilee, Rembrandt's only seascape. The thieves themselves were not art connoisseurs, and I'm sure the collector was uh, not very pleased with uh, getting a, a rolled up Rembrandt uh, as opposed to one in a frame. For the Gardner heist, master art thief Miles Connor was a perfect suspect. He also had a perfect alibi. He was already behind bars, serving 11 years for trafficking in stolen art. The FBI pursued thousands of other leads. The paintings were reported to be nowhere and everywhere in galleries, in private collections, but all the sightings were dead ends. I think this case has been worked in probably every office uh, in the FBI, including Europe, Japan, um, South America, Mexico, Canada, and so on. We've been all over the world in this case. Seven years after the robbery, the Gardner Museum upped the reward for the paintings from $1 million to $5 million. Reporter Tom Mashberg decided to re-examine the case. He learned that Miles Connor had told his prison cellmate that he knew who robbed the Gardner Museum. More intriguing, Connor's personal possessions were in the care of a small-time criminal and antique dealer named William Youngworth. And Miles Connor thinks he knows who robbed the Gardner Museum, then it's certainly possible that the loot from the Gardner Museum was hidden among Miles Connor's belongings. Like Mashberg, the FBI also suspected Youngworth was holding the Gardner's masterpieces. In 1997, the FBI raided his home, but didn't find the stolen artwork. They did find some marijuana and an antique pistol, 
Hoping to use this as leverage, the police arrested Youngworth on drug and weapons charges. Under pressure, Youngworth offered to provide information leading to the stolen paintings. But he wanted three things in return. The $5 million reward, immunity from prosecution, and freedom for Miles Connor. Obviously, I was intrigued by Youngworth's assertion that he knew the whereabouts of the painting. But it had to be checked out. To prove that he had the goods, or at least had access to them, Youngworth arranged for reporter Tom Mashberg to take a drive. At midnight, a mysterious man would pick up Mashberg near his office and take him to a secret location. Mashberg did not tell the police. At the time, I thought it, it, it was sort of almost silly in a way. It reminded me of being a kid and playing a game like Secret Squirrel. The mystery man didn't say a word. He drove Mashberg around for an hour, as if he was afraid of being tailed. Finally, he stopped the car at a warehouse on a dark street. Using a flashlight, the driver led Mashberg inside the building and up several flights of stairs. He grabbed a tube out of a storage bin, opened the top, and pulled out a rolled up canvas. Was it one of the gardener's missing masterpieces? He then unfurled it in front of me and held it in front of his body with one hand like this and the other hand with the flashlight and shone the flashlight along the painting up and down for several seconds and then uh, directed the flashlight to the signature where it said Rembrandt. To Mashberg, it looked like Rembrandt's The Storm on the Sea of Galilee. The front page story about his adventure caused a sensation but the FBI and the Gardner Museum remained skeptical. To further prove that he had access to the missing artwork, Youngworth arranged for Mashberg to receive photos of two of the stolen paintings, along with some paint chips. An independent expert said the chips were consistent with the paint used by Rembrandt and other 16th century Dutch masters. But the Gardner Museum's own experts said the photos were of reproductions, and the paint chips did not come from either of the stolen Rembrandts. When you can prove it, we'll talk to you. Well, in the case of Mr. Youngworth and Mr. Connor, um, they never could prove to us that they were in a position to do what they said they could do. Today, Miles Connor and William Youngworth are out of prison but they've had a bitter disagreement and no longer speak to each other. Connor says that given the right financial incentive, he could still find the missing masterpieces. How? He won't exactly say. It's not an easy task to recover those paintings. Uh, they're not uh, reposing in someone's basement who may have died. Uh, that's my understanding of it. It's hard to just come in to work every day and um, you know, know that they're, they're still out there somewhere and maybe there's something that you're not doing, somebody that you're not talking to uh, who might be in a position to return these pieces. Does Miles Connor really know where the paintings are? Have they been sold off to a private collector? Are they hidden away in a warehouse? For the Gardner Museum and the FBI, the answers are as elusive today as they were in 1990 when the paintings were ripped from their frames. Schemers and dreamers and true believers. If he wasn't in the robbery, why did he need to leave the country and go and hide out in Spain when the heat was on? These men risked their lives for the money they believed would set them free. Some lived the fantasy. It was headlined as the greatest robbery the world has ever known. Others live the nightmare. He locks himself out of the van with $18 million inside the van. In the end, their stories gave them immortality in the halls, in the gallery of the robberies of the century. Mm -hmm.